So, as promised, this is chapter 8, part 2, dealing with Buddhism and the life of Buddha. Uh, I wanted to separate these two streams of thought into their own lectures, uh, not necessarily because they're competing or anything like that, but they're both distinct and they both deserve kind of a separate treatment. Of course, we do want to consider the fact that they did rise to a predominancy in both regions, you know, Christianity in the West, Buddhism in the East, um, in India, and we want to at least acknowledge that that happened around the same time. And so that is very important significantly when you look at it from a humanities perspective, but I think it's fair to give Buddha his own limelight, and uh, we'll talk a little about his uh, life and his teachings and the rise of Buddhism. And uh, yeah, so Buddha was born in uh, Lubini Grove, which is in the vicinity of Kapilavatu, near the present-day border of India and Nepal, sometime between the 7th and 5th centuries BCE. And uh, there's a little bit of debate and uh, ambiguity surrounding the life of Buddha, when he actually lived. Um, it's kind of open to scholarly interpretation. Um, but before he became Buddha, he was just a man named Siddhartha Gautama. Um, he was actually... In one of his previous lives, he encountered a man who told him that he would eventually break out of uh, the cycle of rebirth and become enlightened. And so his life as Siddhartha Gautama was his final rebirth, so to speak. Um, but it was spoken over him, he says, in one of his previous lives that he would achieve this goal of you know, becoming enlightened himself. And uh, his name, Siddhartha, actually means one who achieves his goal. So Siddhartha's father was a relatively powerful and wealthy leader of a small tribe called Saka, located in the Ganges River Basin, near the foothills of the Himalaya Mountains. His mother, Mahamaya, died a week after his birth, and he was raised by his aunt, who became his father's second wife. Siddhartha believed, is believed to have been an educated, prosperous man, um, young man, and he was considered to be very attractive. He married at the age of 16. At 29, he has a son, Rahula, and being an heir to his father, um, and then having a son made Siddhartha a very prosperous, you know, highly desirable position of authority. Um, people would see him and think, well, they want to be him. You know, women want to be with him. Men want to be him, um, so to speak. I guess I'm, it's kind of funny. But there were omens spoken over his life that he would be a great, successful leader. And so his father actually sheltered him from all things unpleasant. And he sort of lived his life growing up in kind of an ivory tower, so to speak, protected from the, the pain and suffering of the world, sheltered very much so. And he has this great epiphany, this great revelation one day, which is, this is historical in how the revelation comes about. Uh, he, he has this, he learns the inevitable, that there's suffering in human life. Um, that's basically what he learns that forever changes him and uh, sets into motion this whole philosophy of Buddhism. So one day he leaves the palace and he sees three people. One, on one of those visits, he um, sees a decrepit, bent over old man walking with a stick to support himself. And he has this mind opening experience and his thought that humans are not going to live forever. You know, uh, we're not forever young. We all age and we grow old. And then on another encounter, he sees a man who is extremely ill. And he has another sort of aha moment and and realizes that humans are not forever healthy. We are all liable to sickness. So we're all, we're going to get old. We're going to get sick. And then to add insult to injury, he has another encounter with a dead man in a funeral procession. And he realizes in that moment that humans don't live forever. We are all going to eventually die. And so what really shocked Siddhartha was this threefold discovery that aging Illness and death are all facts of human life. Now, this led him to the point to philosophically reflect. 
and he wondered what is the cause of this human suffering um, what can we do to overcome it um, and then he asked you know how can these questions even be answered and this set him into a forward motion of trying to figure out the cause and the source of suffering uh, among amongst humans um, but then he has a fourth outing, and this is significant because Siddhartha encounters an ascetic monk uh, who's a Hindu monk who's shaved his head and he's wearing a yellow robe and he's um, carrying around his his begging pot, which is interesting because in today's culture, um, at least Buddhism that I experienced when I was in Thailand, um, the the monks don't they don't exactly beg. It's kind of understood that if they have the pot and you are a Buddhist yourself, you're supposed to give to those who have the pot. And so in Thailand, um, it's interesting because everyone who's a Buddhist, which is just about everyone in that form of Buddhism, is expected to spend some time as a monk when they're growing up. Um, and there's a lot of really cool documentaries out there about that as well. And they carry around this pot, and if you see a Buddhist monk, you're supposed to give alms to them. You're supposed to help them because they've chosen a life of asceticism. They've chosen a life of self-denial. They are not uh, working jobs, all they do is, you know, pray and uh, fast and all those things that go along with meditation and the life of being a Buddhist monk. And so Siddhartha encounters one of these, This is in that, again, that Hinduism had such an influence, or Brahmanism actually at the time, um, would have had so much influence on Buddhism that this image of the monk is actually, a, comes from that Indian Brahmanism Hinduism religion. And so Buddha sees this guy and he says, you know what, that's what I'm going to do. And he shaves his head and his beard and he leaves his parents weeping at home. They're, you know, they're lamenting the loss of their son essentially to this ascetic lifestyle. They're kind of bewailing his departure. And uh, he begins a life of homelessness and seeks enlightenment for the next six years. And he finds it. <laughs> So, according to the, the the story, he seeks enlightenment. Six years later, he attains it. Um, meditation would lead Siddhartha to the full perception that the cause of human suffering is desire. That is, attachment to material things. And so, desire is the source of suffering. Um, so, for the next 40 years, and he dies at the age of 80, um, the Enlightened One preached a message of humility and compassion, the pursuit of which might lead his followers to Nirvana, a grunge band from the 90s. No, um, Nirvana being the ultimate release from illusion and from the wheel of rebirth. Nirvana is this place of eternal bliss. It's kind of like heaven, um, but it's really nothing nothingness it's the it's the total elimination of self it's the total absence of anything it's nothingness which is a great thing to achieve um, but that is nirvana and that is what buddha taught um, that the ultimate release from this illusion and from this cycle of birth and rebirth and reincarnation that if you can break free from that through um, meditation you know through enlightenment, then you have achieved heaven, nirvana. Now, a little bit about his teachings. Um, his earliest sermons, Buddha already had developed this, what we call the wheel of the law, which is called dharma. And it's uh, it was a simple message, and that he said the path to enlightenment begins with four noble truths. Pain is universal, is the first one. Desire causes pain, is the second one. The third one is ceasing to desire relieves pain. And then the fourth one is right conduct leads to release from pain. So everybody's got pain. The cause of that pain is from your desire. And if you cease to desire, you won't be in pain. And also, if you live righteously or, you know, in right conduct, it'll lead to a release from pain. 
Now, to kind of unpack right conduct in the fourth uh, noble truth there, we call this the middle way or the eightfold path. And right conduct includes these eight um, these eight things. Right views, so you have to have the right perspective on the world, um, politically, ethically, morally. The second one would be to have right intentions. And so they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Well, for the Buddhists, the road to nirvana is paved with good intentions, the right intentions. You have to have the right speech, so you have to say the right things. Um, you have to have right action, so you have to do the right things. And then you have to have the right livelihood. So you have to have the right job in order to be on this eightfold path. Um, so if you're unemployed, well, yeah, maybe you're not going to make it through nirvana. The right effort would be the sixth of these of this eightfold path. And then right mindfulness and right concentration. And so right views, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. The Eightfold Path leads to insight and knowledge and ultimately will lead the follower to nirvana. Now the Buddhist goal is not as it is in Christianity, which is this promise of immor immortality. You know, Christianity, you know, Jesus says, you know, come to the Father through me, that John 3.16, of course, the popular verse that says we'll have everlasting life if we believe in Jesus. And uh, the Buddhist is, is 180 from that. Uh, they don't, it's not eternal life that is supposed to be so appealing. It's rather this escape from the endless cycle of life and death, the endless cycle of birth, death, rebirth. We want that to end completely, as a Buddhist would say. So for the Buddhist, salvation lies in the extinction of the self. Now some similarities, and there are a lot of similarities between Buddhism and Christianity, but uh, just to give you a little connection between Buddha and Jesus, they were both similar in that their, their messages were egalitarian, um, you know, kind of for everybody, um, men, women, rich and poor, and their message was reformative. And so whereas Jesus came to reform and to redefine the understanding of Judaism, Buddha was reforming and redefining the understanding of Hinduism. And so Buddhism spread um, in a pretty radical way. And so just as in Christianity we had Constantine and Theodosius, which the text again doesn't mention, but um, we have these leaders in Rome who, who facilitated and perpetuated the, the rise of Christianity in the West. We have a similar scenario with this with the reign of Ashoka. And um, that represents a crucial era in the history of Buddhism, which became transformed into a universal religion, just as Theodosius, more specifically, made Christianity, you know, Catholicized it, made it universal. Um, Ashoka did that with Buddhism and made this the religion become a universal you know discipline and um, even though it was only practiced by a small group of followers in the beginning, a lot like Christianity, Buddhism changed under the reign of the emperor Ashoka. So Buddhism lost its anarchical anarchical. I mean, it was kind of chaotic. There was no real rules. It was kind of rebellious in a sense to the, the system that had been Im implemented through Hinduism. But Buddhism lost that kind of anarchy, that nature of anarchy, and constructed and began to be constructed politically into like a social philosophy. And so the social politics of the king was, uh, King Ashoka, was inspired by the Buddhist principle of public welfare. And so Ashoka actually um, orders roads to be open, wells to be dug. He prepares every type of assistance for the poor. He even builds animal shelters. So many institutions of this kind were established even in nearby countries because of the efforts of um, the king. After his conversion to Buddhism, he strove for the diffusion of this religion 
and he sent missionaries to various countries. And so they began to actually proselytize. They sent out monks and nuns to, to go you know, to the ends of the earth, so to speak, to preach this message of Buddhism. Now some scholars even suspect, and I thought this was interesting so I'd share it, since we're kind of, we've got Christianity and Buddhism kind of in uh, the same conversation here, but some scholars even suspect that the ascetic lifestyle of Buddhism influenced the Essenes, which we mention in Judaism. Um, which some scholars think John the Baptist may have been in a scene. And so, you know, John the Baptist lived in the wilderness, um, ate locust and honey, had a camel hair, um, clothing, and, you know, a rope tied around his waist for a belt. You know, the guy was, he was ascetic. He was like a monk. And uh, you kind of see this similar monk mentality that rises up, especially in the Middle Ages. In, in the medieval time, we see a lot of the monks denying themselves, living in seclusion. Uh, Buddhism, their monks, same kind of principle here. And so they think that the efforts of the king pushing this proselytizing movement of Buddhism, trying to reach into the West, may have very well actually been successful in, in having an impact on some of the ascetic lifestyle of um, Judaism. But the king made Buddhism the national religion, but he didn't forbid other religions. So you know, because Buddhism at its core is, it's really a philosophy. And it's not, um, in like, you know, with Christianity, you know, people say Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Um, and so there's this sort of, you know, no other name under heaven by which we are saved. It's very strict in that, you know, people don't embrace typically very much a pluralistic worldview. But in the heart of Buddhism, it's more of a philosophy. It is a religion, but it is welcoming to, you know, it's not to alienate, I guess is my point, other religions. And so the the efforts of the king to spread Buddhism and instill that as a national religion, in fact, ended up kind of being helpful to Brahma, Brahmanism and Jainism, which really, if you think about it, um, when you look at India, the, the religion... Buddhism didn't really take off in India the same way it did in other places, which is kind of similar to what you see with um, how Christianity didn't really take off amongst those who were Jew, um, Jewish people in the time. So it's really interesting to see kind of these parallels. But um, my point is, at the heart of Hinduism, or sorry, at the heart of Buddhism, was this welcoming, kind of pluralistic embrace of, of all religions, but they of course believed their philosophy was the correct way if one wanted to achieve nirvana. Now there are two principal divisions in Buddhism that are kind of what we see today. This is kind of what we've ended up with in the earth today as far as Buddhism is concerned. And um, that is the division of Hinayana Buddhism, which is kind of called actually in another term, lesser vehicle. And then we have Mahayana, which is the greater vehicle of Buddhism. Now, Hinayana Buddhism is also called uh, Theravada Buddhism. And this, this way of Buddhism emphasizes the personal pursuit of nirvana, and its followers consider that in doing so, they remain close to the teachings of Buddha and his emphasis on self-destiny. Now, Theravada actually means doctrine of the elders, and so it's kind of believed to go back closer to the heart of what Buddha taught, and it's also called Southern Buddhism, reflecting that parts of Asia um, that embrace this kind of Buddhism are typically in the Southern region. So you've got Sri Lanka, Thailand, uh, Burma, Myanmar, uh, Cambodia, and Laos. But Mahayana Buddhism, on the other hand, elevated the Buddha to the level of a divine being. And so even, even though really at the core of Buddhism, it's kind of atheistic. Um, you know, it's not really, there's not an emphasis placed on is there a God because your ultimate goal is to achieve nirvana or nothingness, not necessarily to achieve divine status or meet a divine being or be connected to that divine being. But in Mahayana Buddhism, the Buddha has been elevated to this level of divine being. And it taught that Buddha was the path to salvation, kind of like the way, you know, he is the path to salvation, that he had come to earth in the form of a man to guide humankind. Now, it sounds a lot like Christianity in this, in this sense. 
Mahayana Buddhists regarded Siddhartha Gautama as both one of the Buddha's earthly incarnations. Um, and this is kind of, I think this is pretty influential from, this has been influenced by Hinduism because they sort of believe the same thing about, you know, Brahma, you know, his God is, is there's only one God, but there's many sort of avatars. And so, you know, Siddhartha would have been but one of Buddha's earthly incarnations of which there had been many in the past and would be many in the future. So the gods of other religions, including the 300 plus million Hindu gods, were also just incarnations of the Buddha. Which would really, according to Mahayana Buddhism, they would probably say the same thing about Jesus Christ, that he was just a earthly incarnation of Buddha. You know, whether that's true or not, who knows. But they, I'm pretty sure they would make that argument. The gods of other religions, including those of Hinduism, are just incarnations of Buddha who had appeared in various bodily forms in his previous lives. Mahayana Buddhism is often thought of as a heterogeneous movement embracing two main streams. One would be the perfection of wisdom, which was a tradition of self-emancipation through insight, perpetuated by the Far East Zen. So sometimes you hear this form of Buddhism called Zen Buddhism. Um, that would be this. The Pure Land was a tradition of salvation, would be the other stream. Um, salvation by faith in the grace and power of certain personif personifications of, of the Buddha principle. And so Mahayana Buddhism was the blending of this perfection of wisdom and the Pure Land. Mahayana Buddhism is found in Nepal, Tibet, China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. It has spread around the globe with the Chinese and Tibetan diasporas, a.k.a. Tibetan Buddhism. And so there you have a treatment on Buddha and the rise of Buddhism in this era, which will conclude our reflections on Chapter 8.